Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out to um, our, our virtual program. It's great to, to see all of you and connect with you. And it's a wonderful honor this morning to introduce to you a um, uh, wonderful photographer and, and friend uh, of the museum. I've gotten to know John over the past year or so and lots of conversations. Um, so I'm excited to introduce him to you. He, uh, John, John Pender Hughes has been a working photographer for over 50 years. He has worked as a commercial photographer in New York City for more than 45 years, operating his own full service studio during that time. But simultaneously, his fine art photography, known for exploring variations in pattern, texture, light, line, uh, and numerous other themes of the self, has been widely exhibited and is represented in major collections, including the Picker Art Gallery, Colgate University, the Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, Detroit Institute of Arts, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, and here at the Ringling Museum as well. Uh, Pender Hughes's talent and reputation for excellence have been recognized with many awards, including awards from the Art Directors Club, design competitions, the Clio Awards, Creative Excellence and Business Advertising Awards, uh, various magazine competitions uh, as well. It's also been the recipient of numerous grants, including most recently the Katrina Media Fellowship from the Open Society Institute, uh, where he worked as a fellow in post-Katrina, Louisiana. Um, he has also been featured in numerous publications, uh, including uh, and appeared in several books, including Barbara Milstein's Committed to the Image, Contemporary Black Photographers, uh, and he's also the author of his own books, uh, a cookbook called Family of the Spirit and four children's books as well. So an incredibly productive uh, career. John, welcome uh, virtually to The Ringling. It's good to have you here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So Everybody, hi. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Well, I wanted to get started um, talking about what got you interested in photography because you know we talk about these sort of origin stories I guess um, it's always interesting when there's a certain spark or a certain moment when there's a, a kind of flash that someone has that makes them realize that that this is what they're interested in this is what they want their career to be and you had one of those moments when you were un younger can you talk about that sort of moment of realization that you wanted to be a photographer? Sure. Um, the summer between my freshman and sophomore years in college, uh, I spent two months in the mountains of Ethiopia and uh, with uh, an organization, organization called Operation Crossroads Africa, which is the organization that the Peace Corps was designed after. And uh, there was a girl in my group that had a camera and two lenses. And I was so um, you know, when I was a little boy, um, my grandmother, who I was extremely close with, I'm her first grandchild, so um, she would come in and I'd be watching Tarzan. And it was upside the head. Turn it off. And so I had always wanted to go to Africa. And uh, being there, and anyway, to make a long story short, at the end of the summer, the young lady had to ask if she could have her camera back and her lenses. And I was smitten. I knew immediately this was my thing i knew i loved this and i've never turned back so what what was it what, what about that experience with the camera was so meaningful to you what what sort of revelation well i was there to learn um you know i had been taught you know i'm african american but i'm not african and I didn't grow up there and I don't, I don't know their customs, their language, their anything. So uh, I was taught as a very early age, you needed to learn. And 
the camera was helping me to learn because I was looking through it and I was seeing how you can look at things differently by changing the focal length of the lens and the spread and uh, all kinds of things. And I was just uh, fascinated. And um, like I said, I've never turned back. Well, it's interesting. You, you mentioned your, your grandmother being such an important influence on you when you were young. And you told me one of the reasons why she was upset about you watching Tarzan was this, this image of the, the white man who was the protagonist in, in Africa, basically, was sort of such a distortion to her. Yeah, it was a very big distortion. And she's a very, very kind of light-skinned lady, but she was born in the 1800s in, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. And that was not a pretty place to live at that time. And she was determined to teach us who we were and understand that I come from a very loving family. My family, all of my family, I adore them all. You know, we, we come, we were brought up in a very loving environment. Both my grandparents on that side, my father's parents, were physical education teachers. And they both taught in Washington, DC. And that's where I was born. And um, they did their best to teach me to be upright and strong. So when you, when you came back from this trip and told your family that you wanted to pursue photography and you were, you were in the middle of your education at that time and you sort of decided that you wanted to make a change, how did that come about? How did that go? It didn't go over well. My father told me I was crazy. He said, so what do you want to do? You want to take do weddings? I said, no, mm -mm, that's not what I'm going to do. Um, but they eventually supported me. You know, I, um, I went through the next couple of years of school and then I said, you know what, I've had it. And I dropped out. So, um, um, but, you know, years later when my father started going through magazines and seeing my work, and he was like, oh, okay, all right. Um, I understand a little better now. Hmm. He got to appreciate what you were doing and, and respect. Well, he began to appreciate that I was going to be able to make a living. Mm -hmm. I think that was the most important thing for him. My mother was more art oriented. You know, she said, oh, this is beautiful. And my father said, yeah, but that ain't worth nothing. <laughs> but that was his, his thing, you know, but. Um, well, part of that, I mean, you, when you were starting out to um, you had to really learn on your own and there weren't really any, it was hard to find mentors and, and perhaps it was hard to find role models, other uh, African-Americans who were successful photographers to, to speak with. I mean, there, there weren't any, I eventually, um, I took two jobs which weren't really photographic, but um, they ended up helping me a great deal. Uh, the first job, I worked for McGraw-Hill Book Company, and uh, I was a graphic arts purchasing agent. But what that did was it taught me a huge amount about printing. Mm. And of course, back then, all the magazines, all the things, everything was printed. But it taught me about that, and it taught me how to make my images the correct way for that. And then I did paste up some mechanicals for a Venture Magazine, which was part of the Look family. I don't know how many people remember Look. Look and Life were big competitors. And one of the things that happened there, of course, is that um, I used to go upstairs to the Look Lab where they'd have all these famous photographers up there. And uh, they'd have stuff on the wall. And I said, well, that's kind of nice. How'd you do that? What'd you do? And they thought I was a messenger. So they would tell me in great detail what it was they did. 
Wow. Thinking that I didn't understand. And then I'd leave and they'd laugh a lot laughing. And the guy who ran the lab finally told me, he said, you know, they, they think you're a messenger, man, that you don't have a clue as to what they're saying. And I would go home and I would try it and I would try it and I would try it until I got it. And so I was teaching myself. But, you know, it didn't matter to me that they laughed at me. I didn't, I really didn't care about that. Um, that was really not important. Uh, what was important was me to learn. And so I learned, I kept picking up on, on different things. And I kept building myself that way. Um, and then of course, uh, I started working. And at first I was doing more editorial, you know, magazines and whatnot. But fortunately for me at that time, um, there were quite a number of ethnic publications. Hmm. And so I was able to work and I learned from that too. So this was a time when uh, there's, there's more and more advertising and marketing directed to the African-American community, which was so yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, um, I mean, this is something I've been kind of famous for. And they had an organization called the Black Owned Communications Alliance, which was advertising agencies and um, magazines and uh, all kinds of things that was directed to the black market. And back in those days, uh, it was it was all black. Uh, now it has changed, but um, you know these were some of the things that I started off doing, advertising wise. Um, and of course, this is for the same organization, but. Uh, you know, I don't know if people remember, um, mm, what's it called? Versus the Board of Education, um, the Supreme Court decision that uh, the main, um, the main guy was um, Dr. Kenneth Clark. And he had gone to the South and he had gone into various schools and situations where he would offer a child a choice between a white doll and a black doll. And they always chose the white doll. And so he was studying this. Why, why did you choose the white doll? Because the black doll is bad. Hmm. And he made such an impression on the Supreme Court that they decided in his favor. But that's what this is. It knows the little girl, she's not smiling at all. Somebody's giving her a beautiful black doll, but she's not happy with it. And um, I mean, these were a couple of ads that um, kind of got me started. And uh, this was back in the late 70s. And uh, Still, it was important. Um, and I loved it. I, I'm, you know, I love shooting. So um, uh, I had to come up with the thing, you know, you notice, I mean, little things like the, I had to eventually burn down the, the paper you see behind her. So it got a little darker, wasn't quite as bright as it is here. But, um, and she was a wonderful little model. She was terrific. She did whatever I asked her to do. Anyway. So you also did um, a lot of work with musicians uh, and mm -hmm. did photography for album covers too. I did a lot of, lot of music business stuff, a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So, and you got to meet and work with uh, some of these artists, I imagine. Oh yeah, well, you, you had to meet them to work. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? Well, it was pretty cool. Um, I mean, you had to get past um, 
you know, I mean, some of them were very nice and other of them were a little full of themselves. And, uh, um, you know, you had to get past that. And once they understand that you were, you were serious about doing the work, uh, it usually worked out pretty well. You know, they would talk, we would talk and just do things and uh, um, try this, try that. Um, you know, uh, some of them were big stars already. And uh, like Aretha was a big star. And uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, um, I think know. this is ludicrous. That's ludicrous, yeah. And before that was. But that, that's Babu. actually not an album cover. That's just a promo piece, sort of. Um, so, so some of your work was actually used on album covers. Others were was promo material for these artists. Most of it was, different. most of my stuff was album covers. Uh -huh. Most of my stuff was album covers. Uh, Roberta Flack, um, a lot of people. So you had sort of continued success um, in the 70s and early 80s, you know, commercially and, and for decades um, to come, but you are also passionate about your own creative work. Can you talk about how you sort of balanced these um, these two sort of strains in your in your practice in your work? Um, or were they intertwined? Did you see them as sort of separate kind of uh, paths? No, I, I see them as very separate. Um, you know, the album covers, the ads, uh, that's how I made my living. That's how I paid for my kids and my wife. And, you know, that's how I made my living. But my guts was more into my personal work. Um, you know, and I did a lot of little things like, well, this one is, uh, of course, the number one of the series that you bought for me. And it's called Pretty for a Black Girl. And this was a young lady that um, uh, had come to me, been sent to me by an art director. And she wanted to be a model. And she was, you know, she's much younger than me, of course. But uh, we started talking and having a good time. And I was photographing her. And, um, you know, two things happen. Once when a model comes to you, they get some work, but they have to do what you want to do. So you try different things and uh, et cetera, et cetera, to build your portfolio. And um, she called me one day and asked if she could stop by. I said, sure. And um, when she came in the door, she was crying. And she had been out the night before. And um, I guess I had sort of become a mentor and she wanted to talk. and. What she wanted to talk about was she had met a guy who she was very attracted to. And he apparently was very attracted to her. But at some point he said to her, he said, you know, you're very pretty for a black girl, I mean, a dark skinned girl. And it really hurt her that he would say something like that. And so we kept talking about it. And I said, you know what, let's photograph it. I want to photograph your emotions. And so we did. Um, I don't know whether you can tell, but I'm shooting with a, a, a big camera, five by seven. Mm -hmm. I'm not, this is not 35 millimeter. This is a big camera. So it's very, um, very slow and laborious, but you have to know what you want to do in order to do it. So it, it seems I like. I think, think I was fairly successful and I'm very pleased with it. So, um, and she loved it too. It feels like this was a, almost a collaborative work between you and the absolutely, model. absolutely yeah. collaborative. Yeah, because she opened up her emotions to me in a way that uh, doesn't happen often. And it's one of those, um, you know, to me, I think it captures a moment that I think happens so frequently. Um, with people uh, in in our culture, um, I think that that women of color, especially black women, this is something that 
they've they've heard in their lives, you know, frequently. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. one of those things. I mean, I think today we call it a microaggression, a sort of enforcement of you know racist ideas that are part of our culture and how we define beauty. Um, but you know, it's something that profoundly affected this model, and the person who was saying it likely didn't even think of it or or thought he was giving her some sort of compliment you know he thought yeah he thought he was giving her a compliment which he wasn't he was breaking her heart so um but um you know i like doing a series like this where i explore something a thought an idea um well i think it's really effective too because in the series of these four images you know, she's sort of looking in the mirror, thinking about her reflection, pondering um, mm -hmm. the gaze. She's gazing back at us and sort of interpolating us into the situation. And then she's also looking off to the side and her back is, is then turned to us in one of the images. And it's sort of enacting all these different gazes within uh, the series of images. You know, her reflection. And she, she's, at us. she's dealing with herself. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and and then there's a like on this one the, la the last one which a lot of people never see is the tear that has rolled down her cheek and that's in this image yeah the tear that has rolled down her cheek and if you look very carefully there's a streak up high and there's a tear at the bottom and a lot of people don't see it because they don't yeah. look i hadn't noticed it until you pointed it out to me when we when we spoke uh, probably a year ago mm-hmm Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the powerful, one of the really powerful um, images in this series is the one where the model's back is turned to us and we see a scar. Well, it just so happened that she had been operated on and she had the scar, but I, I used it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show her pain. And um, it just so happened that she had that scar. Um, you got to work with what you got. Well, and it's a, it's a really powerful, you know, visual metaphor too. That this, what what reads to us as the viewer as as violence, you know, done upon her her body, um, I think really refers to the history of violence done to black women and black people. You know, over overall. Um, so that sort of serendipity there, you know, provides an extra layer of meaning for us, I think. But as you said, this model just happened to have, you know, a scar because of a, of a surgery. Well, if, had. if she hadn't had the scar, I mean, I'd have figured something else out yeah. to show some more pain. Uh, cause she was extremely hurt. And, you know, I don't think she'd ever been through this before. So she was mm. extremely hurt. And she's a nice young lady. Nice young lady. Very sweet. So this series um, was exhibited, I think, fairly frequently. It was in uh, that committed to um, committed to the image book and exhibition and a few others. Mm -hmm. But you've exhibited widely, though, with uh, many of your other projects as well. Um, Early in the 80s, you, I believe it was in the early 80s, is when you joined with the um, Kemoingi uh, workshop. Could you talk about that a little bit? Um, it was a group of black photographers and I'm um, a little younger than some of them because there, there's quite a few of them that have passed on now, but um, um, you know, now I'm one of the older ones, <laughs> but um, there were quite a few of them before I joined the group that I was friends with, you know. Um, well, and that group had started in the 60s with um, Lou Draper, Roy DiCarraba. Yeah, in the early 60s. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, of course, I was still in college then. But... Um, I kid my friend, Adja Cowens, who's now the president of the group, and uh, Adja's about 10 years older than me. Oh, 
Ed is 85, I'm 75, and, uh, um, but we've been friends a long, long time. And um, back then, of course, uh, a lot of the younger photographers now have gone to school for photography. You know, when I was in school, they didn't have any, nobody taught photography. You know, Adric was one of the only ones he had gone to University of Ohio, I think, and they had a photography program. People don't don't really realize is that you know teaching photography at the university level is fairly recent. You know, it's really very really recent. Been, yeah, yeah, very recent. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. since maybe the seventies and eighties when that became more more common. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for so many people, it was learning kind of on the job or yeah, learn as you go. Mentor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's the way the group started with. Uh, a bunch of people getting together and looking at each other's work and commenting on it and critiquing it. And if somebody discovered some new little technique, they might tell the rest of the group that you ought to try this, try that. Um, little things talking about chemicals, different chemicals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Because everything back then, of course, it, it wasn't digital at all. It was all in the dark room, all wet. And um, so, so that's the way I learned uh, in a wet dark room, not not digital. Not on a yeah, not on a computer using Photoshop. It was real Photoshop. No, Photoshop didn't happen until much later. Yeah. You know, um, so working with Ken Wingate, I mean, and this is a group. So people, so that people understand, this is a group, as you mentioned, where. Photographers are coming together to sort of share and help teach each other, but you all are also organizing exhibitions and, and books and workshops, kind of a mutual support mm -hmm, group mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. for black mm -hmm. photographers. Mm -hmm. Well, back in those days, if you didn't help each other, nobody else was gonna help you. And I mean, that's just the truth of the matter. It's like I was saying about when I was go up to the lab and I would ask these questions to these photographers, these white photographers, and uh, they thought I didn't understand what they were talking about, so they would tell me. But you know, with Kamoingi, it was very different. You 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 talked about things, and you taught each other, and you critiqued each other's work. You know, and you would say to people, "Hey, man, that's." Why'd you do that? Mm. And because um, nobody else was going to do that for you. So the group still exists. And um, I won't say we would expand it. We still got about the same number of people. But uh, we have a lot more younger people because quite a few people have died off. And um, um, it's, it's amazing because that group that workshop is really uh, probably one of the longest running kind of organizations to to offer that sort of support and, and community. It's been around for, I guess, almost be close to 60 years now or 50 some years that that has been uh, continuing. Mm -hmm. we, think of, we think of other groups in the US at least like you know the Photo League earlier or, or others and they often only last about 10 years or so or something like that. So it's mm -hmm, mm -hmm, a fairly mm -hmm. long established um, group. Well, I wanted to talk about some of your other projects as well too, because one of the things that you're passionate about, um, well, this is one from the, the Burnt Offering series and there's a couple of series we'd like to talk about, but this one I think is really, um, really fascinating to me because it's a body of work um, that you photograph basically the the artifacts, the remains, what's left after an amazing meal. Um, can you can you talk about what gave you the idea to do this body of work, the burnt offerings, and what it means to you? Well, as you said, I, I'm a published cookbook author. I love to cook. And, you know, I would gather with my friends and we would cook and eat and laugh and drink and carry on. And at some point, I just looked at the detritus that was left afterwards. 
I said, hmm, that could be interesting. So it's kind of like a diary almost. And so I would boil the bones down to strip everything off of them. And often I would put them in the window so the sun hit them and would bleach, bleach them a little more. And then I would photograph them. And again, this is all large format. And um, I don't know if you are aware, but do you know what this is? Um, I don't know if you, you've ever heard of uh, Polaroid Type 55. Oh, sure. This is all Polaroid 55. It's about larger format. It's a larger that. format, but it gave you not only a print, but it gave you a negative. Mm -hmm. And so these are from the negatives. And uh, Well, it's interesting that you include the kind of border in the image that it's the artifact of pulling apart kind of the, the Polaroid um, from the backing. Well, that's, um, that's the, 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 the stuff that stuck the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. So it just um, came up a little bit different and I liked it. So, um, and I didn't mind you seeing that, you know, knowing what I was doing and what I was using. I didn't mind that at all. I, I think it just adds another dimension. It frames it a, a little better. And um, you know, yeah, it's a great I, I reference love, to the act of photography. And it's also, as you mentioned, it's like kind of a ready-made uh, uh, frame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, some of the more recent ones though, you're not still using that same Polaroid, are you? Or No, uh, but what I'm doing is I'm stripping it in and retouching. I have some old frames that have nothing in them. So I use them to strip in. And here I'm extending my ideas about, um, you know, having meals with my friends and loved ones and so on and so forth. Uh, because here, this is burnt offerings too. Um, and these are actually the surfaces that things were cooked on. Oh, right. Wow. So, you know, um, you'd be surprised how heat and oil and whatnot does things and colors and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what these are. They're not the bones, but they're the surfaces that they, the things were cooked on. So I think these are so fascinating. I mean, because you're recording the the traces of cooking and all the meals and all the activity and labor and love that goes into these meals i mean you know we often talk about photography being an index for the world of, of indexing uh reality but this is another way of, of indexing our experiences through the, the the tools that we're using i think that these are mm -hmm. uh, really wonderful and they're also just sort of amazing as abstract images of, of contemplation yeah, most people don't 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 think about what they are, and they 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 are absolutely a contemplation. Uh, I'm thinking about the people that I care about and the meal we've just shared. Or I, so I often, that that's why I call them diaries. That makes sense. Um, and I wonder too. I mean, you know, I was wondering. Is it if you've had like a really amazing meal that you and and you're the cook also. Mm -hmm. in most most of these instances, you know, I wonder if you had a, a wonderful meal and, and then there's also conversation afterwards, uh, you know, that continues into the night. Is it the next day that you think, wow, that was such a amazing experience? Like, I want to make sure I, I photograph the the traces of that. It, it actually usually does happen the next day, the day after, you know, I've gone into the trash to fish something out. Quite a few times. Oh, wow. Something, something just hit me. You know, I said, John, you should have saved that. Wow. Um, with these, it's a little different because they kind of stay like this. And, uh, uh, but the bones, um, and I actually hate to call them bones. Hmm. I call them burnt offerings because they were offerings of love and companionship and uh, that meant something to me. 
I wanted to maybe finish up looking at some of your uh, landscape images because I know that landscape, especially, I guess we could call them seascapes or you know, seashore images um, are really important to you, you know, personally. And this is, these are spaces that you return to often uh, and think about and, and capture. Could you talk about your landscape work a little bit and how you approach your, your subject? Well, this is uh, all of my, almost all of the, the, the long wide landscapes are from Eastern Long Island where uh, my wife and I have a home. And uh, part of that comes from my growing up. From the time I was a little boy, my grandparents had a farm that sat about a quarter mile from the Chesapeake Bay. So I grew up clamming and crabbing and fishing, and I still love it. So the water and the landscape meant a lot to me. And this particular, you know, out on Eastern Long Island, I just loved it. And so um, one of the things I'll add here, are you familiar with the Nature Conservancy? Uh, yes, the organization, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I was on the Long Island board for about mm, 15 years. So I got to see a lot of things that other people didn't get to see. And I always photographed because I love landscapes. And um, I just kept doing them and doing them and doing them. And um, I mean, you know, here it come down in the morning and that light is just so soft and beautiful and you know, I'm looking at out and I'm seeing the, the seagulls standing on the beach and, you know, and it's just beautiful and very emotional to me. So I photographed it. Um, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, how do I say this? I'm not trying to make any great statement here. I'm just capturing what I see and feel. Um, well, I think it becomes a pretty impressive statement, especially in the sort of panorama that you format that you're using here. It's also a testament to how many different approaches you take in your work, which I think is um, really impressive because, you know, so many photographers that we know and recognize, we know them from a particular approach more often than not. And I think you're able to kind of move and shift into different modes of looking and, and uh, capturing images, which I think is um, really impressive. And some of your sort of detail of the uh, details of the seascape too add this really sense of mystery and contemplation of form that I think is um, really fascinating. Some of the images of um, patterns in the sand too, uh, I think are really appealing when they start to lose their, their reference and become just explorations of uh, form. Well, you know, you had started to show the, the one, the, um, and this, this is a whole another series. And um, I had, um, and these are fairly recently actually, but I had, started meditating and by meditating I mean I would think about things and I would look at things and then I would look closer and closer and closer and the closer you look the more the thing changes and it becomes something that you didn't see before and that's essentially what meditation is trying to look closer at yourself to see things that you hadn't thought about before. And that's what I started photographing these things. Um, well, and it's, you know, the, 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 the camera is a, a way for us to sort of do that, to focus in on things that we 
don't normally see, even though they're in front of us. You know, people have talked about the optical unconscious, like that, which is around us all the time, but we don't take notice of. And it seems mm -hmm. like your, mm -hmm. your photographing is, you could say meditative in a way, but, you know, isolating something that we would not notice that we would that, not. That's what I'm saying. I'm looking closer it. and closer and closer at something and trying to see it in different light. And then I started photographing it. So, um, so as we're, I don't want to make sure we have time for any questions, but I'm, I wanted to ask you what, what sort of directions you're moving into now? What sort of ideas or things are, are, stimulating your your work and your thoughts i'm always coming up with something <laughs> um you know my thoughts change daily um some of the things the landscapes i keep doing the burnt offerings i keep doing uh, i've been doing those for years and years and years and uh, i just keep doing it and um um, I think one of my new things is I'm beginning to, when I was much younger, um, there was a program I went through called the WNET Film and Television Training School. And that came about because, uh, WNET, the, the public radio television, started Black Journal. And um, they discovered that they could not field a great crew of just African Americans. Hmm. Why? Because the union was all father son. Even women weren't in the union back then. And so they started the film and television training school to address that. And I went through the second year. But then at that time, I was also getting busy with my still stuff. So I just kept doing the still stuff and I didn't go into that. And uh, um, But now I've decided that I, I want to go back. And uh, so I'm uh, getting a little bit more into the film side of things. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So this might be something that we see more of from you, some, some film work. Yeah, I think you will. <laughs> um, I got a ways to go yet. <laughs> well, but, um, yeah. We, we look and forward I, to I it. I continue to do other things. I, 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 I do, I do, I do. Um, I have a daughter that's in film and um, she lives in New Orleans. And um, uh, I mean, she's, she's really rising, you know, and um, you know, all the big films that get shot down there, she's on the crew. So she's doing, uh, so we talk all the time. Uh, you must be proud of her, but it sounds like now you're going to be learning from her a little bit. Yeah, well, she's my daughter. <laughs> so I'll listen to her. Just like she listened to me. Well, that's amazing. I think that might be a nice note to take a pause on for a moment. And Laura, do we want to see if there are any questions for John? Sure, yeah, I don't have any from the chat, but um, you are welcome to submit them via the chat and or you can just unmute and go ahead and ask any questions you may have. Um, I, my name is Clyde Sweet and I just wanted to ask John, uh, he mentioned that some of his early work he was doing with um, large format cameras, five by seven. Um, is he Eight still using? Are you still using those large format cameras? And if not, how do you how do you like that in comparison to the digital formats? Um, I use them occasionally. The problem is is that you can't get the film anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like the uh, Polaroid stuff 
all of it's gone. I mean, gone. You can't buy it. You know, there's, there's not, there's not. And that was the film that I love using. And so, um, I don't, I do it occasionally. Um, but I, I'm not pressing the issue, like I said, because, um, you know, none of the Polaroid films can you get, period. They're gone. And you can still get four by five film. Uh, but then the problem comes about where do you get it processed? Or where where do you still have a dark room, which I don't. I always had a dark room. And um, now my daughter has asked me for all of my equipment. And so I'm going to give it to her because she still wants to do it. I don't. Um, I, I, I shoot digitally because um, you have to. I mean, that's what exists nowadays. Um, I'm not always happy with it. And I'm not always happen, happy having to sit in front of the, the, the computer screen. You know, back in the day, you could do a job and you put in a piece of film for a test. They process it so you could make sure it was all right. And that way, you know, if you wanted to push it a stop or half a stop, a quarter stop, you know, whatever you needed to do, you could do it. But then once you put it in, you could go back out and shoot something else. Now you're stuck in front of the computer which I'm not a big fan of. Um, I hope that answers your question a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, uh, just to follow up on that, I, I learned photography the same way you, uh, I cut my, my eye teeth on large format, mm -hmm. five by sevens, four by fives, eight by tens, and I find that digital photography, although um, it, it, it gives you um, a lot of um, freedom and opportunity to do things um, that um, working on film didn't give you an opportunity to do in a, in, a, in a quick way. I find that digital photography makes you a lazy photographer because it's almost too easy um, to do things. And whereas in, um, in a large format, you had to plan your work, you as to, you said. You had to take your time, you had to frame it, you had to focus it, you had to get the exposure right. You know, you, you had to do things that are totally photography. You know, I right. see the young people now, they jump around, click, 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 click. <laughs> they don't take their time and, exactly. and frame it and um, uh, think about what they're doing before they do it. Everything is so quick. And they figured, you know, well, I can retouch it. I didn't come up that way. I came up where, you know, get it right the first time. Mm. Yeah. So I understand exactly what you're saying. I understand exactly what you're saying. And it's such a different way of thinking about the world too, being thoughtful and setting up your camera, framing it thinking about the light, exposure, what you're looking at. It's very mm -hmm. different to have a iPhone or a digital a camera and just take a whole lot of pictures. And like you said, just sort of use and hope And hope that you get it. <laughs> yeah. Those are good points. Yeah. 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 Uh, John, we had a question from Michelle in the chat. Um, how are you represented? And is your work available for purchase in any format? You've got some fans on the call here. Um. Yeah, my work is available for purchase, my artwork. Um, I'm not shooting much commercial stuff anymore. I'm semi-retired, I guess you could say. Uh, but my art will always be done. And um, yes, I do sell. Um, as obviously you know now, because uh, the museum just bought some pieces. Um, they've acquired, hmm, what about six, six or seven? I believe uh, 
seven, I think, right around. I'd have to mm -hmm. double check, but somewhere mm -hmm. around seven or eight. Yeah. Was there is there a place where I guess we'll do a little plug. Is there a gallery or a place where people can go to see your work or? Well, the best place is really to just go to, to one of my websites. I mean, I have three. Um, one is still the commercial site where, you know, I have all the advertising and the album covers and stuff like that is up. And um, then the other one is my art. And then the third one is uh, things that are like grants and projects that I did, um, uh, you know, for example, the one that you mentioned um, in uh, post Katrina, Louisiana, where I went down and uh, I went into a little community called uh, Point La Hache and uh, I was photographing people and the aftermath of the storm and how they were dealing with it, how their houses were destroyed and, um, you know, um, those I probably, eh, I've never had anybody ask about those, but the, my art stuff, um, I do, you know, I do okay with it, you know, I'm, but I'm always looking to do better. Thanks. And it looks like we've got a question from Mary. Mary, do you want to unmute? Yes, John, thank you so much for sharing oh, your stories and parts of your life's work. I'm thrilled that at this time now you are able to do the type of photography that's for and from your heart. I totally understand that. My question relates to this digital age. And I wonder how you feel about the fact that because of the digital world, there is so much more exposure of photography, some of it not so good, but some of it fabulous. But with that exposure, I feel that everyone who sees it doesn't really appreciate what it takes to create and craft a beautiful image. How do you feel about that, the negatives and the positives of that? Um. Not much you can do about it, to tell you God's honest truth. Uh, uh, as I was saying before, you know, um, and as I, uh, Clyde, right, was was right. Uh, uh, asking me, you know, um, when you're dealing with the old film and whatnot, you, you take your time and you uh, look at things and you think about what you really want to do in a different way than the digital that you do. Digital is just pop, 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 and hope that you get something. And that's not quite the way I, I, I do things. I mean, when I shoot digital, and I do shoot digital, but I take my time. And um, I don't just click, click, click away at, at, at whatever it is. I think about it. You know, and um, for a lot of young people, I think, that the digital is not good because they don't think about what they're doing. They just are so busy clicking the shutter and, and now the cameras, you don't have to cock it anymore. You just press the button and it just keeps shooting. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't, prob I didn't phrase my question properly. I totally understand what you're saying from the photographer's perspective. Mm -hmm. I wondered how you felt about the audience looking at that work and whether they appreciate the trouble that it takes a professional to craft something that is really superb. And there are a lot of images out there from professional photographers, the National Geographic type photographs, your landscape type of photographs. I've seen many of them online in groups of maybe two or three dozen. And as you say, people, viewers also click through them. And I wondered how you felt about people not understanding what it takes to create those images? Um, I'm not a big online person. You know, um, my daughter's always telling me, Dad, Dad, you gotta, gotta do your, you know, stuff. You gotta put it up. I said, no, I don't wanna put it up. You know, for what? You know, uh, who's gonna look at it? You know, 
the people that I really want to look at it um, are usually people I'm in touch with verbally. And then I send them things and we can go through things and sometimes I'll send them something else and uh, so on and so forth. And I, uh, I'm not, um, I think in many ways that, um, you know, the digital stuff has changed so much. You know, if you go online now, everybody's freaking everything out you know, putting, pasting this on that and pasting that on that. And uh, I'm just not a big fan of it because um, I don't think it's well thought out. And I, I just think it's, it's tricks and games as opposed to, you know, dealing with something that's deeply emotional and um, that you want to convey a message with. You know, um, I don't think a lot of that is happening right now. Well, you certainly convey a message with your work. So thank you for sharing so much of it with us. You're more than welcome. Thank you. And I think that was the perfect segue to our last question. We had a question in the chat. Do you have any recommendations or pointers for someone who is about to be in a dark room for a class developing film? Um, take your time. Take your time, make sure your chemicals are the right temperature and take your time. You know, the dark room is much slower than the digital stuff, but if you take your time, you'll get some amazing results. I think that's, I think that's good advice uh, in a lot of areas of life. Yeah, and I think that's a great, a great note to end on today. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your stories and your wisdom with us. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Um, well, and welcome. And thank you all for coming today. It was great to see you all virtually. Thank you for joining me. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Have a good one. <laughs>